Good day. Welcome to Friday, Friday the 5th of May. And uh, I'm Sam, this is Real Love Guitars. And here we have uh, Luis's um, BT2 Mahogany Baby Taylor. And this is a little made in Mexico, three quarter size uh, acoustic, still strong acoustic guitar. And I've got one and it's a beautiful guitar. And it's, it's beautifully made too. It's really unusual in its construction. You notice it doesn't have the, the neck heel sticking out here because it's inside there and the, re the way it's attached is through two screws that sit on the fingerboard and some people um, I've seen complaining about that uh, they're completely you can't feel them they just uh, they look a certain way and you either make a big deal of it in your head or you just live with it and I lived with it and it's a fantastic little innovation because it means you can get all the way up here Play whatever you want right at the top. Um, fabulous sounding guitar with a really nice metallic ringy sound which is very different from the spruce version. Now this guitar um, has come to me for a sort of a look over and a setup before it goes on so it's bought new and actually um, Luis originally was thinking of a, a Sigma um, for about 50 quid less and, and I saw the price difference wasn't so great so I, I recommended or said have a look at this one um, you know and kind of on the basis that I've got one as well and uh, you know I really love it and everybody I know who's ever had one of these loves them um, so anyway it's a it is a beautiful little guitar it's got an interesting neck joint it's a sort of a t mortis no I don't know whatever a tenon joint with lots of little teeth is that the, anyway whatever the joint is loads of little teeth um, joining in, so it's not a typical scarf joint or anything. So it's a very, uh, a very interesting construction. This guitar is, to me, is just slightly unusual in that it's actually um, really good from the outset. Um, I've had lots of tailors before with really ropey actions, and this one is surprisingly good or relatively good. It's not as low as it can be, but it's um, it's actually quite playable from the outset. And some have have just not been, uh, not been on. Up to it. I mean, I'm kind of. Um, I get my my other specs out, which I can never quite get off without pulling everything down. Um, we're looking at about a three millimeter action here, which is a little higher than it needs to be. I think a, a nice action for this is between two and two point five. Two two can be a little bit low for some people. Um, two point five is quite nice. So there's a bit of room there. Um, the I was write it down like I always like to do. So the low E, oh, it's getting windy out there. One of these days, spring and summer's gonna come. Low E is, uh, yeah, it's three, 3.0. Top E in this case is, it's actually not bad at all. It's kind of where I'd like it. High E is 1.6, so nice, um, quite nice setting. And then we have, what else do we need to know? Oh yeah, we need to know things like the relief and stuff, which again feels pretty good on this. So I don't, I don't think there's any major problem. So the, the adjustments on this, I think, will be very, very minor. Um, and as a result, it's obviously not going to cost too much to do. It's not, it won't require any major work. Um, you know, some of them have been difficult to play. Um, <coughs> My, my advice to people has always been, and if you think it, if you have a suspicion that it's difficult to play, put it a capo on it, and then feel it and listen to it when you've put the capo on. And it, uh, if it becomes beautifully easy to play, then it's uh, it's you know it's the way it should be. And on on this, you'll find that the the first fret action is very very small. If you uh, cap it on the first fret, and then if you take it off and you look at what your real first fret action is, if it's substantially different from your capoed first fret action, if you get what I mean, then you're kind of looking at an excessive height over the first fret that you don't really need. And not only don't you need it, the higher it is, the more difficult it is to play. And beyond a certain point, and this is what I learned from my tailor years ago, beyond a certain height, um, we're fairly high on that one. Beyond a certain height it actually starts run the risk of producing intonation struck tuning issues because 
um, it requires you to press the string down so far to fret it on the lower frets uh, that it actually distorts the note and pushes it sharp. So this possibly has a little bit of it around the bass notes, but it's not. So I'd say it's. I mean, we're looking at point seven here. So uh, we got low E, not point. I go seven five easily over the last fret, first fret. Sorry. Um, I think it's a bit less on the first. Yeah, it, may, it may well be cut to a gradient or um, it may, may not. I think we're giving it probably a little bit, but from my experience of these, to imagine that this is deliberately cut to a gradient may be just a tad over generous. Um, it's not, not because they don't want to or there's any you know, evil plan on Taylor or any, but any acoustic guitar maker. It's just that this is, a, think about it, this is a machined process. You cut a certain depth down here below the fingerboard and you shove in uh, a piece of tusk of whatever thickness and you hope that works so this is really this is about it's about 0.55 over the top high uh, first fret so to me honest most of the most both of those are over the over what I would want to play with it now the reason I've got the tuner going there is it may be you may be able to spot that if we've got an E there and that isn't always the case but sometimes you'll see that playing an open E there, when you fret it, even with the light, rel well, the lightest touch I can do to make it fret, it's going slightly sharp. If you, most of us don't play absolutely the lightest it needs, which, which you know, most of us grab, tend to grab a handful. And that's, it is partly technique, obviously, you can, if you could manage to do the lightest, possible grip for all your fretting, you would minimise some of this. Um, but one of the other ways of doing it is to reduce the height over the first fret as, as a way of safeguarding against um, not having that detuning. So, you know, it's a kind of six, six, one and half a dozen of the other. Sometimes it's high enough that, that, that you just can't avoid it going sharp. Um, you know, most people playing a chord. get the F there going sharp. I say it's not so high on this um, that it's causing a major problem but it is a little bit higher than I'd want. So um, taking it down does two things. It, it minimizes the likelihood of that sharp, playing sharp when you um, fret chords or notes in this area. But the other thing it does by definitions, it makes it lighter and easier to play, which is never a bad thing. And with a tiny adjust adjustment in the action here, overall you just get a lighter feel to, to a, a guitar. And in fact, when you, if you make those adjustments over the first fret, what you tend to get is a guitar that, without a capo, feels more like, well, it's not on properly, but it feels more like a guitar with a capo on. Which can be, suddenly can feel very light and easy to play. And it's always a good indicator. If you've got an acoustic guitar or even an electric, stick a cap on the first fret and play. And, you know, so long as your, your action isn't a mile high up here, given, let's assume it's reasonable down here, what you're going to find is a, is a very small uh, gap over the new first fret. So, for example, we have 0.75 on the open string. Um, and down here we're now at an action of way under, um, way under that. And what you'll see is, in fact, Morris out there. You'll see, in fact, it's it's probably okay. Just that's a little bit higher than this. Is. Can't see it. It's point three. Okay, so it's just over point three, which is where I kind of like to aim for, and that, that's actually as high as it is. Partly because the the action is a little bit high here. So if you had the action set where you wanted it at the bridge, you'd find that was somewhere around about uh, point two, something like that, point two five, 
versus the 0.75. So in a way, what you're seeing is, and that doesn't sound like much, but it's half a millimeter higher than it needs to be. And, the, and people would say, well, if you do that, it's, it's gonna buzz and it won't ring open. You know, it, it doesn't automatically. He's <laughs> going to prove it all wrong by not doing it tight enough. But it, you know, it doesn't automatically. Um, it doesn't automatically strike the frets. Um, any any more than let's say when it's here. So you can you can. When I started doing this, I, I picked somewhere between the two values, really. Um, so on an acoustic guitar like this, I would be aiming for somewhere around about 0.4 of a millimeter over the first fret. Um, hello, Morris. Those things. Yeah, about 0.4, but not not any lower on an acoustic. Um, on an electric, sometimes, um, depending on the, the guitar, I'll, I'll aim, aim for about 0.3 and go down. Um, to sometimes as low as 0.25, depending on what the neck's like and how it's setting up. Um, so this is a very small adjustment to make at both ends, which is no problem at all. Um, and we should, thanks, Morris. Yeah, should easily be able to make those adjustments without any need for any. Um, come on, Mister. I know you want attention, but you can go down. Let's go. Put you on the stool. Let's move the water. The Vols water. Anyway, yeah, very small adjustments on these to get it there. Um, the, the only thing, I, the only nervousness I have at all when dealing with Taylor babies is the tusk nut. It doesn't behave quite the way that um, bone does, um, and, and, it, and it just means that very tiny adjustments are quite challenging to do. Um, so we shall see and uh, uh, once or twice in the past i've re ended up replacing with a bone i mean the saddle's bone because bone's good stuff but they somehow they ship with a tusk style or a new bone or tusk or something but as i say it just doesn't quite behave the way um bone does which is really dependable and easy to work on which is kind of why i like it now, I just want to check, I'm not sure what this shipped with in terms of string diameters, diameters, gauge. So we look like we've got a, a 52 on the bottom. The reason I'm asking or thinking about that is uh, in order to make the adjustments, what I have to do is do a couple of little on and offs to get at the um, saddle at the back here. Um, and I was just looking when I saw when this guitar came in and I noticed some, a bit of corrosion is the word I was looking for, a bit of corrosion on the strings. Um, which may be that they've been sat in a shop for quite some time. So I'm, I've got a set of Martin extra light strings in the house, which I think are through to 52. Ten, so that's, whoop, that looks like a 10 or yeah, 10, 10 through to 52 or 11, 52, depending on. And then a 10 stroke 11 through to 52. So that's a pretty much straight like for like, and that, that's what these guitars seem to like—the lighter gauge strings, anyway. Um, so, uh, and the other thing then, I'm going to just check the measure and check the, the relief. So what I do on that is to fret the guitar, or capo it at the first fret, and then just hold down the last fret um, and check what the uh, midpoint really between the two positions, check what the, uh, the gap is. Now, I would say it's about 0.2, just an eyeball. I can be wrong very easily on these things. But it's quite hard to see when things move. But that's perfectly reasonable. Guitars will play with um, the completely dead flat neck. It's, it's not. It's not in dispute. Let's see, it's higher than that. Um, they will play with a dead flat neck. But the theory is that they prefer to have a little bit of curvature in because the string spins more near its centre point, which actually is about here. Um, but the only the centre point of the neck is about there, so it's a bit of a mismatch between the string's biggest point of movement and the neck's uh, point of maximum curvature. Okay, so we we've got actually got. Let's see, it's actually 
more than I thought. It's 0.3 millimetres of relief, which is the thing for me is it that what, if it plays beautifully well, the only reason you would adjust it down would be to lower the playing action around the middle of the guitar. Um, if it's really extreme, then what you can find is that the, the string starts to hit the frets as they come back up this curve, if you get what I'm saying. Um, if it's extreme, but in the sort of range that it is currently now, it, it both needs a bit of spin, room to spin in the middle, um, and you can uh, you can change how it feels by taking some of that um, relief out of it. And what you're aiming to do is, in a sense, you want as little as you need to make the guitar play without strings hitting the frets here in the middle. Um, as little as you need, so that you don't raise the apparent playing action in the middle. Um, along with your other adjustments on either end for the playing action. So it's a kind of combination of all, all three things. As I say, 0.3 is a little bit higher than some that I see, um, but it's, it kind of it doesn't sound or feel like a problem. So I'm going to just see how it feels at the end and leave it as is to begin with. So um, the issue here is we've got three uh, if I'm drawing out in my mind, we've got 1.6 um, and we've got 3 and I'm going to say let's aim our target for 1.3 and 2.4 let's say as a, a, a strange target. Um, we're aiming to take down um, 0.3 on the treble side and we're aiming to take down uh, 0.6 on Base side. Now, that that uh, a drop of 0.6 here is a is a larger drop up here because it's we're working in triangles. If you sort of see what I mean, so the the height here gets bigger as it gets here. Um, so if we take down uh, if we took down 0.6 here, the reduction wouldn't be quite 0.6. I don't. I, I haven't got my maths book out, and I still haven't worked out a simple formula, and they're bound to be one. Somebody help me, anyway. Um, but but if you want to play a conservative game when you're doing it yourself, if you took your 0.6 off here, then actually it wouldn't be 0.6 there, it would be slightly less. So you could start with 0.6 off the saddle, uh, and you probably would end up with an action here of, let's say, 2.6 instead of 3. Um, given that we're starting with 3 here, so 0 0.6 there might turn into about 0.4 there and less as you get down towards the nut. So even if you don't have the maths brain to work it out, um, you can always go on that sort of common sense conservative, sorry to use that in the, in the uh, light of last night's um, regional elections, but if you, you know, a conservative approach would be to say if I do drop the, the amount I want here off here, then I know it's going to be less when it gets to here because of the nature of the triangle and the changing of the, verti the vertical or perpendicular height. Um, anyway, so like I say, it's 0 0.6 and 0 0.3 is what I want off here, um, and I'm, I'm going to take a very small amount off here. Now, what I need to know, and I'll probably go in the house for this, is to go and get the set of strings because I want to match up as perfectly as I can the right um, files to do this. These strings are it's pretty well done. They're sitting proud of the surface, and they will still be sitting proud. Um, if you look at when you look at the kind of nature of the slot, it's extremely fine, and it's only just enough for the string to sit in. So it's great. It, it's it's not a lot of risk of um, things the uh, strings gripping. Um, so I'm going to only take this down a tiny fraction more, so it, it, it's not really going to be, we don't run the risk of the strings dropping into the slots too far. If they were, then I would tend to just open them out a bit with a V file if uh, if I had to, and then tend to, once that's done, finish the slot with a, a correct file, and then when that's done, you can go over with a, with a file or sandpaper or whatever, and take off the excess material so you come back to that sort of um, basically the string sitting in a half cup, um, depending on how much you take off of the excess, but that's something you can do afterwards. won't need to do it on here because it's pretty much close to where it should be. I'm going to stop, go get the strings, back in a minute. 
Eh, I thought I had Martin strings, but in fact what I've got is a set of elixirs. Um, they're very similar. These are actually they're the light, they're not ultra light, they're 12 to 53, so um, we shall see. Um, I mean, we can start off with the view of reusing these. Uh, it's just, it depends on how many times I have to take them off and put them down. Um, I'll go, I'll take my reading anyway off the diameters of here, or the gauge of here, because um, I'd like to cut larger or bigger than the actual gauge anyway, so that we don't get any binding. So if we're, we're 12 for the first, then I want to go to, where want to go to, 12, 13 at least, probably a bit more if, if I'm being honest, 12, 13, 16, 17 is too little, so 24, 16, 24 at the next jump. 17, well, I suppose we we could go 17. 13, 17, 24 to 28, bit of a gap there. Uh, 32 to 36, and 42 to 46, and then 53. If we're going to do it, uh, we'll go with a combination of files plus some what they call what do they call them? 42. Sorry, 42. I need something else. Uh, files and a thing they call welding nozzle cleaner. So 42 to 46, and then a 48 to 53 on the outside. Okay, so hopefully this won't be too long. Now, like I said, I'm going to aim for a 0.4 on this, a conservative across the board, and we are we're over that on all all sides. So what I do, I don't really want to d dazzle dazzle you. Um, it's difficult to do this without getting the light falling in the picture, but the lights. Kind of helpful for me, so I shall rearrange you. Ooh. Okay, it's a rearrangement. Okay, so let's start with the. the um, hang on, let me just think. Now I'll do. I prefer to do it in a certain sequence. So I'm going to do the, the saddle first, and then I'll do the first right action second, which is the way I normally do it. And people. I know that people kind of, everybody has their own way and some people insist for various reasons. I think there are certain orders of doing things. So I think the thing to just keep in mind is that you do it in the order that feels logical to you, providing you understand what the relationship is between these three things. The first fret action, the last fret or the saddle action, and the neck relief which is the curvature of the neck. So those three things, each changing one of those will alter the other two. Um, and as long as you know that and understand that, you can get to where you want to go. And actually, I think, honestly, there's probably as, as many arguments against when somebody insists it must be one way and one way only. There's, there are probably some logical arguments to say, well, actually, no, it's not just that way. Um, so no, I don't think it makes any sense getting stuck in those arguments. It's the most important thing is you, you recognize that the three things are related so that whichever one you start off with, the others have to kind of work towards the, the kind of the, the end point, but knowing that you know that if you started with this one first, um, your relief will stay the same, but your first fret action will change slightly. And that's okay because um, when I come down to it, I know that um, I'm going to aim for the same point four, whether it's changed because in the meantime because I've made an adjustment to this. So anyway, so I'm going to use this is quite, quite snugly snugly fit by the feel of it. So I'm using my fret pullers as a way of um, gently easing this out. Uh, it's nice and snug. That's one good positive thing. Um, some guitars they, you find the if the neck. Uh, the saddle, if it's um, not thick enough, it can tend to lean forward. So we have the compensated 
saddle. The little kink is, is the B part which lives up here. Um, so it's kind of easy to know which is which. The, little thumb, the thumb kink faces the nut. Okay, so I'm just going to hang this out of the way safely. For a second. Put this neck down here. And so what I'm looking at is what was my decision. Okay, so off the base side, I was looking to take, make sure I got my finest pens there somewhere. Looking to take 0.6, which is a very, very fine measurement. So it's going to be tiny little measurements. I was going to take 0.6 off the base side and 0.3 uh, off. Yeah, 0.6 and 0.3, and, and I, I was aware that those were going to come to less, slightly less than what I was aiming for, but that was okay because it was being conservative. So we go to millimeters and we zero and we go 0.6. Actually, hardly, hardly anything, as you can guess, it's half a millimeter. Okay, and I'm going to go to there. It's 0.7 in this case, because I know, in fact, that 2.5 is a little higher than I would normally go anyway. So I line this up as best I can and make my mark before Morris appears on the scene. And then I'm going to go point 0.4 down the other side. Hello, Morris. You smell like you've been eating something. Ew. What have you been eating? Hmm? Oh, sorry, I'm not giving you enough attention, am I? You, Mr. Mascot. You who caught... Don't, 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 don't. You who caught a blackbird and brought it in yesterday, so I had to rescue it at 6 o'clock in the morning and then set it free. Didn't I? Yeah, he's good, Morris. He, he, when he hunts, he doesn't he doesn't kill things um, as efficiently as his sister does, which is nice. That's nice. Okay, so what I've got is I've got my two marks, and there it creates a little on this a little bit of a tiny bit of a gradient because I'm going a slightly different amount each side, and then I'm going to with Morris looking. There's a more for attention. I'm just going to draw my mark on that. And the aim of this now, or the task, good boy, will be to um, sand this down gently to meet the marks on here. Just showing this on the end so I can see what I'm aiming for, is to sand down to the mark um, without making the, basically without losing the flatness of the bottom of this. So it's, it's doable, um, just got to be careful. And for, for that purpose I use a piece of sandpaper stuck to a flat oak board of, I think it's oak, probably was somewhere along the line. Um, and then I'm, it's a kind of a sort of manual thing, so you can get yourself into position. You, when I'm hello, when I'm doing uh, when I'm doing a gradient, I need to put a little bit more force onto one side. Is that for me? Tea. Yeah. yeah. I just had one, but thank oh, you. No. But thank you. I'm so sorry. <laughs> I know you weren't to know. So I'm just putting bit more great power force onto the base side and then so talking about my biscuit. No. You want to it for me? No. And then hopefully we get to a point where the uh, the line is straight. And what I tend to do is I'm watching all the time for its right angledness because it's really important that it sits in the bottom of its little slot correctly. But once I get to um, the right even mix of how much has got to come off, then I can just start taking it all off in one go. And I tend to um, move all of me rather than move my hands because that way I can see that it's staying flat. And practice your dance moves. Yeah, that's right. Mm -hmm. <laughs> all right. Oh, yeah. Yes, so just moving the whole of me from side to side. 
and you can see it's then it's evened out the discrepancy between the two sides and we're just now working down towards the line um, but always that perpendicularity is the key thing and stopping checking it so while I you know when I'm doing it as I'm doing it slowly there's always time to um, if I go off on a little bit of an angle, there's always time to correct that. So you don't ever want to race away too fast with it. The slower it can be, the better in many ways. Okay, so we're going to get there. I think the rocking side to side with it is pretty is quite good because you can you can really make sure that it doesn't waver from the vertical. Um, I mean, you could make no doubt you could make a little jig for the very purpose. Um, the other thing about this, of course, is that there's absolutely no harm if you go too far with this when you're doing this. Um, there's absolutely no harm in. Uh, shimming this back up once you've gone to a certain point if you don't like the way it plays if you think you've taken too much off you can very easily shim it back up with some thin uh, material I, I often use tin very thin strips of tin because it's a dependable thickness I can kind of quantify and measure easily um, and you know, on these guitars, a uh, little piece of metal, varying thicknesses of metal makes a good shim. Or you can use hard plastic or something like that in the bottom of the slot. Um, on the more modern tailors, they come with the piezo pickups are in the side or the wall of the, um, the bridge uh, slot, so that it doesn't shimming it doesn't even get in the way of the, the pickups, which is good. Um, sometimes, well, it's not an issue exactly, but when you on some of the on mine, for example, if I shim the uh, the saddle, then I know there's a shim standing on top of the uh, the pickup element as well. Which ultimately, if it's a hard material that's dense and it'll transmit the vibrations, that's fine. But you know, you run the risk eventually of deadening it if you put in lots of spongy stuff, which obviously we wouldn't do. But Anyway, so the, the point here is that we're taking this gently down to the mark that we're aiming for, um, keeping it perpendicular or right angled at the bottom, and then the knowledge that if we go too far we can, we can shim if we want to. There's always that option. Um, Very nearly there. I could give this a clean afterwards, it gets a bit grubby with fingerprints. But very slow and sure. I'm putting a little bit of a tilt on it to get the square bottom edge again. Yeah, that's pretty close. And then what I'll do is, I usually do, is I'll just gently take off any kind of edge. Um, because it's a very tight fit I don't want it to sort of get stuck trying to go down in the slot. There's a tiny bit more to do. Right, we are there. Actually you can see there's about it's about another quarter of a millimetre that we could go down on this. Let's take a, f a f hair's breadth more. Right, I'm stopping there. Throw it around. Yeah, I'd say that's almost on, almost dead on the line. So a bit of like another cup of tea. I'll be running inside in five minutes. So just a bit of um, 
naphthery stuff, solventy stuff to give it a clean off so get it back to a bit of a nice shiny bone look. Um, out of this stuff, this was petroleum ether which I've had uh, for quite some time in a large quantity and it's just about run out now so I'm any minute now I'm due to switch over to some Coleman fuel which I bought. Not because I, it's been, is it more expensive? Maybe I bought it because it's a bit more like naphtha in fact than uh, the stuff I've been using which is more pet petrol where it evaporates quicker anyway. Right, so here we have our our saddle, get the right way around and ease it back into the slot and see it is a tight fit. Now I'm going to replace the strings. Remember, tension as much as possible, make sure they wind idly again. The strings are a bit crimped, I have to say. So we'll see which which is better to replace them or to keep them. I'll see how they sound at the end. I mean it, it makes it a little bit cheaper not to replace them and uh, you know they, they are kind of in essence brand new so if we can if we can do this minor adjustments without too much stress on the strings then it's just as well not to change them. the other thing you've got to be conscious of uh, yes that's, that is actually a really good point um, just reminded me of something that I found out once before with a really tight fitting uh, saddle like that you can get caught out the original saddle may not be uh, down to the bottom of its slot under pressure it is possible and it's happened before and what you do then is you end up cutting down the amount you want to drop the action by and before you know it, when you put it back in and push, it goes to the bottom of the slot and you're suddenly in trouble because you've got to shim it. Um, I'm not saying that's exactly what happened there, but you could have done. And it's, it may be like possible to do if the saddle is a very tight fitting one, which that was. The similar thing happens at the other end when you're setting the first fret actions, by the way, um, and you have Sometimes the, uh, the strings don't go down into the slots for cutting, if, particularly if you don't put them under the right tension, in which case you can carry on cutting the slots and before you know it the things have uh, kind of stuck halfway down and you keep cutting and then at some point you get to the right tension and it pulls itself into the slot and you're suddenly on the first fret without meaning to. saying that's what's happened here but it's, uh, it's always possible especially when it's tight. Woohoo! That's interesting. Popped up. It's jumped out of its thingy. Let's, let's just wheedle that one back in. Come on. Mm. Ow. It's going to bend this string. This is what I don't like about Reusing strings is that they, they start to you know, get manhandled a bit, um, which is never that good for them. But again, you know, it's the difference between 10 quid's worth of strings or not. Right, let's just get, I just want to get this one back on a second and then we'll carry on. Don't come out. See, they, that, that's also slightly the way this string's been wound on. It's just a little bit too. I don't know what the word is. Um, too, not quite enough threaded through to hold on tight. I'm having to sort of coax it on again, so it's going to guarantee that it bites and stays. Thank you. Be there 
shortly. I noticed also the front ends on this were a tiny bit sharp in places, not unbearably. tuning This will, when you, when you slack the strings off, they're always going to store up some slack when you do them back up again, so it's sort of kind of guaranteed. Okay, so now we have a nice, well, a lower action, um, and let's see where it ends up. We could just do the maths on this. Well, well, well it's down to where I said, 2.5. Well, I said 2.5, but we got down to 2.5. Um, so that's not bad. I like it. I don't think there's any reason for going any further. Um, I say mine is a bit lower, but I am a bit of an extremist, and I, I've learned my lesson not to overcook it for customers. Because it can be a bit disconcerting. What I like doesn't necessarily work for everyone. at both ends. Uh, I can make I can make a truss rod adjustment if we want to take out any more action. But again, we can experiment with that, and you can as well. It doesn't hurt. You can take the curve out or put it back in using the truss rod without doing any damage. And you can see for yourself the quite substantial difference it makes to how the action feels. People think um, because the because the truss rod adjustment does affect the uh, the perceived action or the, the action playing action. People make the mistake of I suppose it, oh, mistake is the wrong word, but people sometimes think that the primary way of adjusting the playing action is via the truss rod. And if, in a way, I would suggest to think, of it, think about it as a secondary effect. Um, the, the truss rod's primary effect is to set curvature to allow the strings to spin in the amount they need to. Um, secondary effect is to increase or lower the action, but only in the centre part of the string, uh, centre part of the neck. So, okay. So we're still we're still over on all of these. So I'm going to do the the uh, the nut slots now, and then after that we can explore any relief adjustments we want to make. So I'm just going to now take off the lower two, and I'm going to work on uh, the check the height of the action over the first fret of the D string, and it's currently above 0.4. So what I do. So I'm going to lift this out gently. I'm going to pick my chosen uh, file, and I'm just going to gently work into that slot, um, tilting backwards, and uh, bearing in mind that it doesn't behave quite the way that bone does. I'm going to try my very best to take this as slow as possible because I've 
very easy to run past the mark very quickly. So we're almost there after that. Um, and the, the, the kind of game here is to cut gently, tilting in a consistent manner backwards. Um, Just on the mark, just just where we need to be. But um, yeah, the key is to go tilting backwards slightly because you need the uh, you need the string to rise up to the front of the nut and off the front. So then I tune. So as I say, the 0.4 is a conservative setting for acoustics. I am happy usually with anywhere between 0.3 and 0.4. And the idea is to go until it just stops playing and then you know you're, uh, you're, you're on the mark. Which is there, it just zings off. Um, and it's very, very, uh, a very small measurement, so it's a tiny adjustment. And that's why um, I prefer... prefer bone. Because at those tiny um, increments, bone is more dependable, or more predictable in the way it behaves. So I'm just going to dig up a 0.53 gauge for the file. Um, just to make sure I've got the right one at the outset. Doesn't, we may leave the original strings on, but 0.53 won't be a problem. Um, okay. 0.55, that's a bit big. Where's the next one? It's even bigger. Uh, 0.4, let's try another set. These are Oh, blimey, I'm jumping around. These are, I've got a variety of these sets. They're very cheap. 0.5, that's not big enough. Um, they're very inexpensive and you can have a few of these sets. Uh, they're very good as, they're very useful in it for going where you're missing a, a slightly wider number like I am. Or if you're going to use the, the method that I show, show in my ebook, which is um, how to use a, a V file, a very inexpensive V jeweler's V file, to do all of the slots. Um, there we go. That's the one we want. Uh, and that allows you to, if you use the cheap, inexpensive V file, you can then finish off the bottom of the slot, just round it out with these types of um, welding nozzle cleaner things, um, just to give it the shape that you really want it to have, rather than a V shape, which could run the risk of um, crimping the strings or pinching the strings, which is uncommon, but it's worth checking, or worth pre you know, preventing. So what I've got here is I've got 48, um, just to, if I need to take out any depth, be careful, and wiggly, wiggly waggling it a bit. Um, down again so I can get it off and it up. I'm going to use my not very easy to handle um, set of nozzle cleaners but you can see with a bit of pressure you can you know, a bit of patience you can get there It's a bit of patience required at this point because we're just cutting away again, a little bit of depth cutting with the 48 and then a little bit of rounding out with the 53. It's kind of a compromise really, but it just widens it out so that you don't catch, you don't end up with a string catching anywhere. Close. Not 
quite there. So I can see fresh air under it, but we're nearly there. So um, a little bit of this and a little bit of that, and we'll be there. Uh, but I think they're about five pounds a set. These little things, and I've got a few so that they kind of never run out. And they are not the greatest cutters in the world. And you have to be careful not to run them up against the, the peg head, as our American friends would say, but they do the job. I'm happy with that, I don't want to go any further. I'll stop there, playing the conservative game. Right, now the top three. And these are often, can be the ones that will catch you out when you're doing this. The, the adjustment here is microscopic. Um, and it's very, very difficult to do this. On, I have to say, honestly, on, I don't know why I'm ashamed of it, but I have to say it, <laughs> on tusk or, or simulated bone, it is very difficult to do this bit. And I can see the difference in height in these two already. I don't think you can see it from there, but between this string and this string, there's quite a pronounced height difference. Um, anyway. You can hear there's fresh air, or you can hear the string playing. So I'm going to use this 28. Now on a headstock like this, there's quite a sideways pull on these. Um, and I don't know if you're cutting it anymore, and you want to sort of put a bit of a sideways angle into it. There's no reason why not to, since it's pulling that way anyway. And you can sort of help it a fraction on its way. far off there, that's pretty close. It's still higher than the other ones. It depends on how you get the, this blade under it. Yeah, I'm going to call it, I'm going to call it there. Being conservative. Tune up. Now these are very close to the original gauge, um, these files now, these next two. So it means that this when you when you go close to the original gauge, there is a chance that you will get binding in the slots still um, so it's kind of I would always be prepared with my bit of sandpaper and blade to widen the slots if necessary nearly there almost there so I'm doing my best to lift uh, the strings as carefully as possible to preserve their life Okay, we're on. And finally, now the other thing about going, what you might I might consider to be conservative height of um, 0.4 means if you do over, so go slightly over, you've got you can go down a bit more. Um, although I try not to, obviously, but like I said, for some reason, tusk is not a cooperative material. Here I am at 13, and small adjustment. And you can hit here, it's not where it needs to be yet because there's still a ring ringing out. So a little bit more in there. on the mark. Yeah, it, if you're ever going to do this, have a spare hanging around. I think that's good for me. Have a spare nut 
of some sort hanging around, preferably bone or if you need to, tusk so that you have an option to replace um, if, you, if you need to. But let's have a look. Yeah. I'm going to stretch them a little bit more, hopefully. Um, yeah, because then you give yourself confidence to make the improvements that you'll feel are kind of, I mean, it's a bit difficult for Luis because you won't have played this before I've got my hands on it. Um, so you won't, know to, you won't know what the difference is between the two, but if you've got a guitar of your own and you want to do this with, um, uh, you know, definitely um, have a go at it because you'll, you won't believe how big an improvement you'll make to the lightness of the playing action. adjustment on your, your bridge action or your saddle action um, it's always worth playing all the notes just to make sure they all um, play and the reason for that is because all guitars have some unevenness in the frets and the truth is you only come into contact with it at the point at which you lower the action far enough for it to um, I guess hit the uneven frets now my experience has been with these tailors is that you have to go below the two millimeter mark um, before you actually encounter the or you experience sorry before you experience the effects of those uneven frets and there will be some under there it won't be mechanically precise or perfect I should say um, but at the height that I or the the, the action I end up at with these it's or it's never yet been close to the mark. So, but it's still worth playing all the notes to make sure. As with any guitar, if when you've made a bridge adjustment or an a, a last fret action adjustment, you find that the notes are choking, and therefore it means you run into the uh, uneven frets. Then your options are the standard options, which are either you raise the action, either you raise the action above the uneven frets, um, which, mo which is what most people do on their, their, their guitars that they own, or you perform a fret level if you really want the action that you're aiming for. Um, and that's that's always the standard choices. And so, for example, tomorrow, um, uh, tomorrow, uh, Scott's bringing me his bass, um, and I've said to him, bef you know, bef before he turns up, set it to where he wants the action to be, or what he thinks that the well, first of all, where he wants it to be, regardless of whether the, the neck will, or the, the frets or the setup will play adequately that way, but as I just said, you know, set it where you think you'd like it as a player uh, in terms of action, height off the, off the fingerboard. And then what will happen is I'll have a look at it and um, I'll see where the frets don't comply with that. And then the, the next part of it is to make the frets comply. Um, but as I say, with these, normally you can drop quite a bit of the action before you run into the uneven frets. And as I said, it's usually you usually have to go below the two millimeter mark here and we're at 2.5 on this so that's absolutely fine as i said i'm not going to go any further i think this is a, a nice conservative comfortable action for a guitar like this <laughs>
Beatles song, remember that one? Two mahogany baby tailor came to me in pretty good condition for a change. Not too many problems, not too high over the first fret, a bit too high, but not too high. Um, and so I've lowered it slightly there, lowered it at the saddle end, uh, checked the relief. You know, we could. Um we could take a tiny amount of. Um, relief out of the neck, just looking at this, uh, you know, and it would, it would just t change a tiny bit, change the way it feels. I'd need to get a, a different kind of socket in there if we were going to do it, but, you know, that's, that's something, there's probably one in the case actually. You'd think there would be. I can't remember what they came with. Nice, nice uh, case by there. Hey man, do you have a wrench? Oh yeah, everything but. No way. Case candy. No wrench. That's not so cool, is it? Yeah, anyway, it doesn't really need it. I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna mess with it. But you could, at a future date, you could take a little bit of the relief out of there. Um, if. To be honest, it's, it's so nice and low now, you, you wouldn't feel the need to. But it's possible, and I do recommend, on all my videos, I recommend people experiment with it. Don't don't leave it be a mystery. You can't, short of really cranking it till, the, till you hear something go crack, which you really have to struggle to do, you can't do any harm. Um, and better, more, you know, more importantly, you can find out what it does, what the feel of the neck change, or what the playing feel how it changes when you make a, a flatten out the neck or you put some more curvature into it. So I recommend you doing that, Luis, anyway on this. Um, and if you do it and you put your wrench, get the correct wrench, which um, I could do it with a socket and stuff, but if you, when you get the wrench and you put it in, uh, if you turn it clockwise, you will flatten the neck out. If you turn it counterclockwise, uh, you will cause the neck to, um, the truss rod to relax and therefore the strings will pull a bit more, probably pull a bit more curvature, you can't say for sure. Uh, a bit more curvature into the neck um, and all you really need to do is just know how much keep a record or in mind how much you've turned it and go backwards if you don't like the way it feels so if you turn it clockwise to flatten it your playing action regardless of what I've already done here the playing action will feel like it's lowering a little bit more but you might start to find you're hearing frets um, not buzzing exactly but it's when the string hits the frets rather than slightly different when the, the strings hitting uneven frets is a different kind of buzz um, and if that happens, you can then bring it back and cause the, the rod to re uh, release and therefore more curvature to come into the neck. So it's uh, totally experiment with it. You can't do any harm. So there we have it. Thanks for watching another Taylor baby. And I have to say, Mr. Taylor and the factory, this was pretty good, this one. And, um, you know, I just I think I want to say again that some, sometimes people say to me, you know, have you got it in for Taylor or something? And no, the, the answer is absolutely not. The only reason I get people sending me Taylors is because I made a video about mine and about what was a very real issue, a high action and also a high first fret action causing intonation problems down here, which for a beginner, if you like, who didn't know about setup, made the guitar really unpleasant. And, and I, actually, I didn't want to live with that. I just wanted to um, I wasn't thinking of suicide, but I wanted to sell it and, and move on and try something else. Until I, I kind of just got really frustrated and learned, figured out, and worked out what was wrong and then adjusted it and I've been doing it since. So that kind of video, the reason I get Taylor's is because I um, kind of made a video about that. And it 
what it means is that because I made a video, I get people who've had the similar issue and then they send me their guitars. It doesn't mean that Taylor's guitars suffer from that any more or less than anyone else's. And it's the same with the Chapman Chapman guitars. Um, I had quite a few come to me with the same problem. It doesn't mean that Chapman guitars made in when they were made in Korea were any worse or better than any other guitar made in Korea. It's just that I made a video about it because that's what I happened to see one day. Um, so I got nothing against Chapman or Taylor. Um, you know they make great guitars, and, and with a little adjustment, then you know they're as, as great as they should be. The truth to tell, would I pref would would it be a better world if that was taken care of in the factory? Yes, but in truth, I also know that it would probably push the price of the guitars up more. Um, and and who's in the world of budget guitars or or when money's tight and everyone's looking for the cheapest price on a particular guitar, who's going to want to pay the extra money? I don't think many people do. So. One of the it seems kind of logical that one of the consequences of a, a sort of price war market is that certain things just can't be done, and you know, spending ages fine tuning the height of the first fret or you know playing around until this is as low as it can be, and or going further and maybe leveling frets and having it really low. Um, those things cost time and money, and and you can understand that the market isn't going to, or the manufacturer isn't going to do it if, first of all, the market doesn't demand it, and secondly, it won't do it if, even if the market demands it but won't pay for it. So there's a logic to it, and I've got, as I say, I've got no grudge or grind gripes with um, Taylor. I love my Taylor baby, and, you know, I'm happy to keep on doing this with people's guitars. Um, so that they enjoy it too, because they are beautiful little travel guitar. I never want to, never want to get rid of mine. It's um, it's my go-to hammock guitar. Uh, why not? A beautiful tone. So um, I'm just thinking, what else could I play on this? Gorgeous little thing. Anyway, there we go. Taylor Baby, lovely little guitar. Mahogany, I prefer the mahogany to the sprucey regular one. Um, I think it's got a, a really nice distinctive ring to it. I would then I would say that because I've got um, an Antoria arch top that I refurbished upstairs that has a similar kind of ring for some reason, although it doesn't have any mahogany in it at all. There's a lot of ply in that, but Beautiful. Anyway, see you again for another Real Love Guitars sometime in the near future.